Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Staple Inn Hall for tonight's sessional event and a discussion of the IFOA CAS International Reinsurance Pricing Working Party paper, analysing the disconnect between the reinsurance submission and the global underwriter's needs and property per risk pricing. My name's Martin Noble, I'll be chairing the session this evening. Uh, quick few points before we start, a couple of housekeeping rules. Anyone wishing to claim CPD should, uh, should pick up the badge um, and enter the CPD on the online record to make sure it's registered. Um, if you picked up your badge, that's the audit requirement. Um, if you haven't got a badge, then please sign in on the front desk. We are filming tonight uh, for publication in the British Actuarial Journal. So uh, in the Q&A a bit later on, if you speak, please do state your name clearly. And if you have any concerns about being recorded or, uh, or films, please let, please let us know. If you could turn, please turn your phones off. Um, the, even, even if they're on silent, they do interfere with the, the systems here. And if there's a fire alarm, uh, then we'll exit um, onto, through, through the arches onto the main road, turn right, and just congregate outside of the Inn of Court pub. Uh, so the format for this evening will be presentation, um, followed by a Q&A, and we'll aim to wrap up at around about seven o'clock or so. Um, so I'd, and I'd like to uh, sort of introduce and open up, open up the sort of technical um, session. So you know, firstly, congratulations to the Working Party on being awarded the prestigious Brian Hay Prize for their research paper, uh, which uh, Dr. Anna Mata and Enrico Biffis will present to you on this evening. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see such a good example of, uh, of, of collaboration, of international collaboration, uh, not just between the IFOA and, in this case, the, uh, the, the Casualty Actuarial Society, but also of actuaries um, across a number of countries. I know the Working Party has you know, several members across several countries, which I know is, uh, is, is, is a feat to, to coordinate, but I think leads to such an enriched sort of paper. Um, you know, I, um, I volunteer for the IFOA and I sit on the, the General Insurance Practice Board, and one of my focus areas is um, you know, continually improving the, the level of engagement with actuaries overseas. Um, one way we try and do that is through research, knowing that uh, research is what in many, in many ways binds GI actuarial communities no matter where they are. So you know, once again, it's great to see an example of that in action here through the, through the, through the paper. Um, so as chair, I'm, I'm invited to open with a few comments on the paper itself. Um, I will be a great injustice here to, uh, to the authors, um, but in summary, the paper is concerned with bridging the apparent disconnect between the information desired by reinsurers um, by way of the pricing process and the information commonly included within the seed and submission to, to the reinsurer. Um, the disconnect then often leads to underwriters that are unable to refine the pricing of a contract. Um, and some of the paper's main results are, number one, to show the importance of each piece of data within, um, within that pricing process requested by the primary or the reinsurance company, and then to provide a re reference document to enable a deeper understanding of how each of those elements fit together. Again, that's probably a deep injustice, but I shall let the, uh, the presenters explain in much more detail uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, and then on reading the paper, I had three main observations um, that sort of come with a couple of questions which we can address in the Q&A at the end, perhaps. Um, first of all, simply, you know, quite simply as actuaries, how often do we make do with, with, uh, with, with a quality of data which is quite often substandard or, or doesn't meet sort of full, full desired um, levels of information? And I think we, we make do with it on, a, on a, you know, far too many occasions. And a key theme throughout the paper is that because, you know, due to the, the lacking of the data needed, a set of assumptions need to be made, and those assumptions affect the pricing and therefore the underlying profitability of the book of business. Um, and certainly from my read of the paper, it's interesting that um, the paper mainly suggests that if all parties shared fuller information, overall reinsurance and primary prices might come down. The implication being that with inadequate information, um, we might price more highly to cover uncertainty, for example. And I wonder whether that would always be the case, whether that there, are, there are circumstances when we might offer more information and the prices might, might go up. Um, but that's just perhaps a question for the Q&A a bit later. Um, my second observation relates to communication. Um, there's a part of the paper that discusses that although the primary insurer might think that certain information is unimportant, to the reinsurer, um, um, it actually, um, it might be of great importance to the reinsurer and vice versa. Um, and I wonder how much of an issue this is. Um, I mean, during the pricing process, 
It's not just you know, communication through data. There is a dialogue between the primary, the reinsurer, the broker. So I wonder how, how effective that process is at bridging that data gap. And given, given the purpose of the paper and the depth of the paper, perhaps that process doesn't work particularly well. So keen to get some comments on that as well. And my third and final opening observation relates to the future. Uh, the working party envisages that as data enrichment gets prioritized by insurers, many of the limitations linking claims and exposure information and other, other pieces um, become less material. Um, and I guess I'm slightly critical that hurdles such as, such as investment in that data, in competitive pressures and confidentiality issues might continue to be a significant constraint on the passage of information and it'd be good to hear from the working party in terms of the time scales over which perhaps those envisaged improvements might be made. Um, so that's my sort of opening, opening comments. Um, paper was a, was a great read, and I think what's often quite difficult to achieve in a paper like this is to give practical advice to, to GI actuaries, and actually I think it, it sort of comes through very clearly for those of you who read it. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that there's lots of practical advice, lots of information to help actuaries um, go about this in a, in a much more structured way. Um, and uh, so I think that the paper has that sort of stuff in abundance. So without further ado, um, let me pass you on to the actual speakers tonight, the presentation. <coughs> um, let me first introduce Dr. Anna Matter. Anna is the managing director and founder of Matblas Limited. She's a recognized pricing actuary consultant and trainer in the London market and internationally. And in the past 10 years, Anna's main experience has been designing and developing integrated pricing software for Lloyd syndicates that comply with underwriting standards, as well as providing pricing support and advice for reinsurers. She's over 16 years of pricing experience in insurance and reinsurance and a wide range of lines of business. Anna is an associate of the Casualty Actuarial Society, holds a PhD in actuarial mathematics and a bachelor's in mathematics. She's written and published a number of papers and is a frequent speaker at actuarial conferences. And in fact, in 2002, um, another of Anna's papers won the Brian Hay Prize, uh, the paper this time, uh, Pricing Excessive Loss Treaties with Loss Sensitive Features and Exposure Rating Approach. So a multiple award winner here with us tonight. Secondly, uh, Enrico Biffis. Enrico is Associate Professor of Actuarial Finance at Imperial College Business School, a fellow of the Pensions Institute in London, and a member of the Munich Risk and Insurance Center at LMU Munich, and also an editor of the Astin Bulletin, which is the journal of the International Actuarial Association. His area of expertise is asset liability management with an emphasis on risk analysis and market consistent valuation for the insurance and pensions industry, as well as design of predictive analytics and risk management tools for a variety of asset classes. Enrico has collaborated extensively with leading financial institutions, insurers, regulated, uh, sorry, regulators, as well as governmental and non-governmental organizations, including the World Bank and the IMF. Notable examples of research projects on data science include uh, the large commercial risks project funded by the Insurance Intellectual Capital Initiative and led by uh, a range of insurers, Hiscox, Liberty, Lloyds, and the Asia Pacific Large Commercial Risks Project, funding by, funded by SCORE, and the Insurance Risk and Finance Research Center at Nanyang Business School in Singapore. So I think uh, you agree with me that our presenters here are highly qualified to talk on the, on the topic in their paper. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Dr. Anna Matter to start the presentation. Well, good evening, and um, thank you, everyone, for coming to the, the presentation. It's been a while since uh, last was in this room, it was 2010. Um, so I'm going to be switching with uh, Enrico throughout the presentation, as we have different experiences in different parts of the, uh, of the paper. Usual disclaimer, so this is the opinion of the authors and not of the respective institutions and the companies that they, that they represent. Uh, I think um, Marty has done a very good uh, job introducing the overview of the, of the working party and the, and the paper. Uh, this paper is actually aimed at everyone working in general insurance, not just reinsurance actuaries, but also those working in the insurance companies preparing submission data for, um, for the reinsurance program. Also, for those, bro uh, for those of you working in broken, broken houses, it's, it's important because you are in between those two, those two parties. 
So what we're going to do is going to quickly go through the main areas of the, of the paper. Motivation, we initiated the paper with a survey. Um, we're going to talk about the results of the survey, um, main points of the paper, conclusions, and Q&A. The paper is, is uh, there is a draft of the paper already available. I don't know if you have um, a chance to get a copy of that. Uh, but the final draft is, is due any, uh, within the next couple of weeks and it's going to be in the British Charter Journal. So this is, was actually a long, uh, a long effort in terms of timing. We started in 2014. The, the, the working party started in one of the JIRA conferences in 2014 and John Buchanan of um, Vera, Vera Risk, uh, the ISO, company, then he started putting together all the participants. He gave me a call and said, Anna, there is this working party. Would you like to take part? And uh, he uh, managed to get 17 members, uh, 18, with him to, to work on this working party. Most of the participants were um, practitioners in reinsurance, but we do have some consultants in the, in the working party. The main idea of the paper was to say what data we get when we're pricing a reinsurance contract versus what data we ideally want in order to minimize the number of assumptions that we have to make in order to apply the various methods of pricing, your exposure rating, your experience rating, and combination methods. So we started uh, the, the working party with a survey to see what people actually receive in this submission. But the idea also was to have something in writing to create a reference framework that said this is best practice when it comes to preparing a reinsurance submission. Here are the members of the working, uh, all the members of the working party. I'm not sure if anybody else is here. So as I said, the, the working party initially was to talk about uh, the, the, the gap between the data received and the data required. But in reinsurance, we have many lines of business, and every line of business will require different uh, amounts and different uh, kinds of data. So th we decided to focus on one line of business to start with, and the easiest one for us was to look at um, property risk excess of loss. Uh, we, we didn't focus on, on the CAT aspect of that, although we make some references. And I think right now there is a formation of another working party on energy reinsurance, uh, which I think John is, um, is also uh, leading. We also try to get some, re uh, some reinsurance underwriters on the panel so that they can provide their view as to, from their underwriting point of view, what are the main aspects of the data and the pricing, uh, and the pricing process. So based on our experiences, if we don't get data, we are going to be more pessimistic in our assumptions. So what will be the impact in pricing of getting the ideal data versus what we actually uh, receive? <clears throat> so as I said, this, the first step was to, uh, um, pro to um, analyze a submission via a survey. Then we prepared the, the, the white paper that was uh, reviewed in a number of uh, occasions, and there have been a number of presentations throughout the development of the paper. I presented in 2015 at the CAS um, European Conference, and John has presented in a number of papers. And we long end up with a publication in 2017. So let's start with the survey. There were 44 uh, responses to the survey, mostly from those working in a, re in a reinsurance capacity, either brokers or um, reinsurance companies, across the world including US, Europe, UK, and some people in Asia. 86% were actually, some 14% from other areas, brokers and, and underwriters. 25 members of the CAS and 16 members of the Institute of Faculty of Actuaries, and 13 members of other organizations. We had representation from UK, US, and also France, China, and uh, New Zealand. So just to get an idea of which territories um, the, the, these actuaries were pricing risk on, this is not where they were based, but where the risk was originating. So we had risk pricing in Europe, Middle East, Latin America, worldwide, and uh, others. And how many years of experience the uh, respondents had uh, in the area of reinsurance pricing. So we had a number of, more than half of the respondents had between 20, 10 and 20 years 
of, of experience with worldwide uh, pricing experience in reinsurance. This is where the actuaries responding to the survey were based. So we have people, people from the CAS, people from um, the Institute of Actuaries and others. And within those organizations, you've got the, the demographics of where they were based, US, Europe, Middle East, and uh, Latin America. So we had a large proportion of US and Canada uh, people based in US and Canada responding to the, um, to the survey compared to European and other regions. So when we're doing pricing, we're not doing pricing in a vacuum. There is always a subjective element to what we do as actuaries in everything we do. Okay, so we started with the assumption that quality of information will have an impact in what we do in terms of pricing. So one of the first questions we asked, how does a poor quality submission impact price? I personally price about 40 or 50 contracts every year. And when I see a good quality submission, my reaction to that is different to when I see a messy submission where I have to look through 40 different files and it's not obvious what data they have provided, things are not clean, they have not been formatted properly, and I have to spend a lot of time cleaning it and, and processing before I can put it in a, pricing, in a pricing tool. So it does have an impact on how we approach the, the risk to start with because it also reflects on the company providing that data. If a company provides data that is in a good order, in a good format, and is complete, someone had put some, th some thought process into it, so you can see, well, this company may have a better operation than another company who provided things without a lot of um, thought process into it. So the response, uh, <coughs> generally speaking, indicates that when there is uh, a lack of quality or poor quality in the data, we tend to make more pessimistic uh, assumptions in terms of development factors, inflation, uh, loadings, and, and, and so on. Okay, so some people say explicitly they will add loadings within the pricing uh, framework. So how does an excellent quality submission impact uh, the price? And again, more optimistic assumptions will be made. They will be more uh, inclined to give credit for good experience if the data is complete and they have provided a number of years of experience and, and so on. Very few say that they, didn't, that they didn't think that it had any impact on, on, on their price. And how much, if we ask people if they could quantify how much the quality of the submission impacted the pricing, whether it was 20%, 30%, and, and so on. So the, the responses were very mixed, but it's medium to high. So if you've got a, a, a poor quality submission, the price will vary, uh, the, the, the price will vary significantly because they will um, take into account the submission 40 or 50% of the process as such. Then we asked ask, uh, uh, the respondents to give us an indication of what items of data they usually receive. So for exposure rating, reinsurance, we need a limits profile, a risk profile of the underlying company. And that is a key element for exposure rating. And we can see that the majority of people receive that. It's pretty standard practice to have some form of risk profile within the submission. And that will be the, the risk profile currently enforced, the risks that are currently live in that portfolio. Now, for experience rating, we also want to know how that risk profile has changed over time. We'll have examples later. And we ask, you know, how many times do you receive that profile going back a number, a number of years? It's not standard practice to provide that in the submission. You might be lucky to get one or two years, but definitely not 10 years. Of, of profile. So the majority of um, respondents, 23% say that they get it. Uh, in the US, only 8% and uh, the, the, the Institute of Faculty of Action say 60%. That 60%, we have some doubts as whether the question was understood or not, because it is not standard practice to get that, to get that profile. So we question that 60% there. So you can see the, the rest of the, of the elements that are required for, uh, for exposure rating, like individual risk listing. Again, it's not, it's not standard practice in property 
uh, risk access um, reinsurance to get a list of every single policy that the underlying company has written. We just get an aggregated profile. Uh, individual risk listing above a certain threshold, again, only few said that they have, they have received that. They might get a, um, a list of the top 10 or 20 locations, uh, but certainly not the, full, not the full history. And similarly for experience rating. For experience rating, the key elements is your um, individual losses uh, and your premium. And the individual losses without an element of, of uh, development, just the latest position, everybody says that's pretty standard, they, they, they receive it if, if the experience is available. But in property reinsurance, it's very unusual to actually get individual losses with the full uh, claims development. In casualty, you do get it as a standard, but in property, it's very unusual. So the responses do reflect the reality there. Um, Description of the, of the large loss, so effectively describing what, what gave rise to the situation, if it was a fire or any other element. There, there is usually a narrative accompanying the, uh, the claims. Historic premium, again, is pretty standard to have historic premiums in the submission. And the other elements you can see, uh, you can see there, like rate, rate changes, for example. Is, it, it, it varies widely by territory. In Asia, for example, you might not be getting rate changes as we are used to getting them in, here in the UK. So what are the considerations? Why the insurance companies or the sedans need to consider improving the data that they provide? First of all, this data process, having personally worked with insurance companies preparing submissions and on the other side with reinsurance companies receiving submissions, some data that we want as actuaries is really not available. No matter how much we ask for it, it simply is not available or it's not easy to be put together for a reinsurance submission. And the reason for that is the, <coughs> the way the uh, insurance companies' rating models are designed. You typically have a spreadsheet, and in that spreadsheet, you the insurance underwriter may put certain items of the submission, but might not put all the details. He might not put each location uh, that is in that proposal for. And believe it or not, the insurance companies, they still receive data in PDF formats, not in Excel. So the broker will actually provide a PDF file with the individual locations. And then unless that insurance company has an intern or a, or a work experience um, high school guy who can put all, all of this in an Excel spreadsheet, it will not be used. And if it's not used in, pri in the pricing, it cannot be provided to the reinsurance companies, okay? So that is one of the practical reasons why reinsurance cannot get this, um, this information. So the process starts when the insurance policy is priced and underwritten, and that will drive what type of data and the granularity of the data that that sedent can then provide to his, um, to his reinsurers. The data is provided to a broker, so you've got a middle uh, a middle company there formatting and decided what items of data are important for the reinsurance pricing uh, or the reinsurance pricing process. And as I said, most companies have reinsurance models in Excel, okay, that are not linked to a database. So even when they take the time to put all the elements of data in the rating model, that is tested as a, as a standalone file. There is no database linked to that. The database simply collects high-level information, a policy reference, the premium for the policy, but not the premium for each building of the policy, uh, the limit and the excess, the main territory. So you might say, well, it's a US risk, but there might be some exposures in South America. But you won't be able to know that because that's not collected in the, in the database. So that is what actually causes the problem of the, of the data. So why will an insurance company have to consider improving what elements of data they collect? 
Well, first of all, it has benefits to them because their actuaries, the pricing actuaries, would like to have that data in a database so that they can refine their pricing approaches, do some GLM analysis, portfolio segmentation. So even if they don't want to provide that to the reinsurer, for the insurance company, there is value in collecting that information in a, in a, in a database. But also to understand, for the insurance company to understand that this information could actually lead to a better reinsurance program overall, to a better reinsurance price overall, uh, may incentivize them to actually start creating databases to collect this information. Now from the reinsurance company's point of view, reinsurance companies receive data from a number of clients. So they take time once or twice a year to create benchmarks. Okay? These benchmarks include exposure curves, cross loss ratios, development factors, rate changes, claim development, all of the things that they gather across all their submissions that they see. So in the summer, normally reinsurance actuaries are busy putting together these benchmarks that they will then use in their pricing. So if a company, if a sedent does not provide rate change information, the reinsurer will say, well, based on my market analysis, I'm going to use the rate changes that I have compiled across the rest of my, of my sedents. Now, those sedents may not represent this particular one, but they have no choice but to use that. These benchmarks are often conservative because they include a number of, of companies, and in addition to that, the reinsurance actuaries will add conservatism to their, to their benchmark. So when a reinsurance company is pricing a treaty, they look at what data has been received. Can I justify my pricing purely based on the data with a fewer number of assumptions, fewer loadings, or do I have to make more assumptions because I have lots of gaps in the in the data. So if we have um, more data, the price tends to be more stable. So a company that had a loss will not necessarily suffer a shock increase in price because a reinsurer can demonstrate over time that the loss was just random and e even though the price might increase a little bit, it doesn't have to be a significant, uh, a significant increase. What about for the reinsurance point of view when he's looking at a new treaty versus a company that he or she has insured, reinsured for a number of years? So they have to be fair, uh, they have to be fair to their company. Say, so, well, I want to take on more opportunities, but if, this, if I don't know this sedent and they're not providing me data going back a number of years, I, don't, uh, I can't pr place that much credibility on their experience. So they will tend to exposure rate it, which tends to be a very um, conservative approach. Reinsurance brokers are the intermediary between the two parties. So they receive the data and they decide what they think is relevant for the submission. And often they keep pieces of data that they don't provide in the submission. They will only provide that to those who ask. Okay, so when you have a treaty where you have a panel of 10 reinsurers, they get the standard submission and only those who ask will get the extra information. So you have people pricing the same treaty with different um, amounts of data. Only if you ask, you will get that. For example, losses with development. If a property underwriter doesn't ask for it, he will not get it. But the broker might have it and give it to those, only those who um, who ask. So to, the, to those of you working broker, have a checklist, a minimum that you know that your actuarial colleagues will have because you will receive every year the same questions, the same questions. So why not provide it up front? Save a couple of days, get all the data out, everything that you've got, and let people decide what they need to use rather than withholding pieces of of um, information, and that will um, foster long-term relationships and, and consistent pricing throughout, throughout the years. But uh, apart from all of these ideal considerations, we have to consider that we are in a competitive market, and that some reinsurance companies are happy to provide a quote with limited information, and others have to have all the elements of data before they can even provide a quote. 
Okay, so that's what we're going to talk at the end. We're going to talk about the winner's course and the bias in the submission and overconfidence of the, of the results. Here is my checklist. Okay, I, I, as I said, I priced a lot of reinsurance, and this is the bare minimum that I expect to see in a reinsurance submission for me to start looking at it. For exposure rating, I need a gross loss ratio. How is the company performing before this treaty kicks in? Okay. I need that because if the company is operating at a loss before this treaty, but at a profit after this treaty, who's taking the loss? The reinsurance. So I need to know the before and after loss ratio. Ideally, I would like that split by CAT, non CAT, because it may be that the treaty were pricing the risk excess of loss, it doesn't cover catastrophe losses, so I don't need to worry about that, a part of the, uh, that part of the loss ratio. And I also need to know whether they're providing me accident year loss ratios or underwriting year loss ratios, because I have to align that to the treaty that I'm pricing. Then I need a limit profile. At bare minimum, I need a banded profile, and also a definition of what do they call a risk. Okay, Enrico will talk about that in detail. And then, I want to know the individual risk for the risk profile. Ideally, every location, the amount of insurance, the excess, the deductibles, the premium allocated. Now, that third item in property is not that common. It's more common in casualty than in property, but the industry is getting, getting there. And for experience rating, I need large losses. Large losses as, as, uh, um, as lower as possible from the threshold that I'm, that I'm pricing. Uh, ideally, I want that loss linked to what was the amount of insurance for that building or the total insured value. And if there was an excess on the policy or a deductible, I also want to know what that deductible was. What's the description of the loss, the date of the loss, and the policy date so that I can allocate that loss to the correct experience year. I want premiums, okay? And they are provided, but sometimes you get 10 years of losses and four years of premium, and that's not good. I want the same number of years of experience for both premium and losses so that I can do a proper experience rating. And rate changes. What are the rate changes that the portfolio has, um, has experienced? And how are those rate changes calculated? We're going to talk about all these elements throughout the rest of the presentation, but that is the minimum. Okay, when I get a submission, I go through a checklist. Do I have this? No, anything is missing. I email the broker. Can I have this information, please? And um, sometimes I do get it. <laughs> And now hand over to Enrico, who is going to talk about the definition of the amount of, um, of insurance. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I would like to go through some of the <coughs> items mentioned by Anna in our uh, wish list um, uh, to share with you some of the experiences I had when working on um, some of these data projects I'll discuss in the second part of the talk. And um, so the idea here is very simple. Um, so we want to understand, for example, amount of insurance, for example, um, what a limit is. And uh, you might think, okay, this is the maximum loss an insurer will pay, for example, the event of a loss. Uh, but when it comes actually to looking at the details, for example, um, it, um, very often it becomes very complicated, for example, to tell whether it's just physical damage, whether it includes business interruption, third party liability, and so on. Right? And then when it comes, for example, to defining what is the risk uh, we are referring to, well, um, you know, it could be um, single location, for example, a specific building. It could be, for example, um, a representative location. or It could be um, um, uh, an average or medium uh, amount of, of insurance or a top location, for example, the highest amount of insurance uh, within a given policy schedule. Um, or it could be even, uh, uh, you know, the, what we call risk. It could be the aggregation, essentially, of um, uh, multiple locations, right? Uh, just the entire policy. So clearly, the, the sort of information you, um, um, you have in these different instances uh, is very different and has the, the implications, right, for, uh, for pricing and for any statistical models. Surprisingly, if you look, for example, at the, at the literature out there, there is a huge gap, right? So, and uh, one of the, 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 the key contributions we find in the literature is this, um, relatively recent paper by Riegel in Astin Bulletin, which is uh, truly beautiful, that tries to classify um, 
um, uh, different uh, um, um, risk profiles, right? So by policy, location, top location, so on. So I invite you uh, strongly to read it in case you have an interest. So, um, so when it comes to, to actually um, presenting the, the information on mountain insurance, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with all these acronyms, but clearly that suggests there is no standardization, right? So you hear about TAV, MPL, PML, MFL, and so on, and uh, very often they're provided, it's not entirely clear, but they're provided by location, for example, or in aggregate uh, terms, right? Um, if you look um, uh, at a subscription market like Lloyd's, for example, um, you have um, slightly different issues. Uh, for example, you could have um, the, the information on the participation by layer of accident um, with um, uh, percentage share, limit, and attachment stack code is collapsed into uh, um, minimal information with uh, essentially lowest attachment point and total program participation. I'm going to give you an example in a second. So clearly, the, the sort of... Um, the way essentially you, 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 uh, um, uh, you give up on uh, using and exploiting the additional information can be truly massive. I'm gonna show you in a second a, a pricing example that's quite, that's quite telling. So if I go back to the results of the survey that Anna, Anna uh, presented, um, if you remember, the Inforce uh, risk profile was one of the, the most common essential information received uh, 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 by uh, uh, companies, and uh, so he ranked number one, for example. So this is an example of a, a banded profile, uh, uh, banded um, essentially uh, by uh, T uh, TAV, uh, reporting uh, different um, TAV bands, uh, um, the aggregate TAV within the band, the average TAV, number of risks, uh, and then the apportionment essentially of the premium across the bands. Okay, so this is an example. So suppose you were to ask, uh, for example, what are the risks exposed in uh, um, uh, uh, $4 million in excess of $1 million layer? And um, uh, you see a table like this one could be very useful if those risks were represented, for example, individual locations. But if instead those risks, for example, were uh, um, uh, specified uh, on an aggregate level, for example, uh, uh, so policy level, right? Then, of course, uh, whenever you look at the average TIV within a given band, you would essentially um, uh, overstate it, right? The, 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 so the exposure rating uh, will, be, uh, will be overstated. So it's very important, just with this simple example, to, um, to nail down and to define precisely what we're talking about. Um, another um, presentation, uh, which is put here in terms of metrics, uh, is when essentially you have Inforce Risk Profile, um, where you have now the uh, uh, two um, uh, um, bending uh, uh, dimensions, uh, the attachments uh, on the left-hand side, and uh, across the, the, the columns, essentially, in terms of limits. So whenever you look, essentially, at those numbers, uh, reporting that particular metrics, for example, you might have uh, that behind the, the scenes, <laughs> Uh, there's quite a lot going on, right? You don't really uh, appreciate, for example, when you, um, uh, you do exposure rating based on this. Let me give you an example developed by Anna, which is, uh, I think, quite uh, very nice. Uh, so here, for example, we are looking at um, uh, um, uh, uh, these um, common uh, programs you find, for example, at Lloyd's. Uh, so layer programs with ventilation. So if you look, uh, if we start, for example, from the left-hand side of the slide, uh, we see essentially there is a um, uh, $100 million TAV, and uh, we got 25 million capacity, which is um, essentially spread over different layers. Um, in this particular example, I don't know if you can read it down there, but essentially the sedent is um, uh, taking 30% of the primary layer, primary layer being uh, $10 million, then 50%, for example, the uh, uh, first excess, 10 million above, uh, in excess of 10 million. Then there is a gap, the ventilation dimension. And then the top layer, so the seed in this particular case, decides to take, say, 34% of 50 million in excess of 50 million dollars, okay? Now, um, the seed and then decides to go for, a, um, uh, for insurance. And if you look at the center of the slide, uh, you find essentially well, what's available there, right? So um, first excess or loss, of five million in excess of five million, so retain, retention of five million dollars, and then there is a second layer, 15 million in excess of 10 million, okay? Now, um, if you, um, as we discussed before, um, collapse all this sort of information in the banded profile, um, which apparently is very common in, in, in the London market, then you will see this essentially as essentially a, a premium of uh, close to $250,000 uh, within a band that with attachment at zero, and essentially the limit being set at the total program participation. So zero, $25 million, okay? Everything you are in the middle essentially gets lost, 
And in particular, for example, the contribution of different layers to, uh, if, for example, if you look at the, 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 the central um, uh, bar chart, um, you lose essentially the contribution of the first excess and the top layer to uh, the first of excess or loss. Okay? So what does it all mean? It means, for example, that this is a, the pricing example I mentioned to you before. So suppose, for example, you use uh, the very simple, uh, may look uh, uh, much neater, but <laughs> way less informative uh, um, uh, uh, information provided with a zero attachment point and total participation uh, as policy limit, what you have in this particular case uh, is that so essentially the, the, the apportionment of the CD premium across the two layers, for example, this particular case is um, um, uh, more or less balanced uh, around 27, 26K for a total of 52. Okay? As soon as you use the more granular information, instead of the one uh, we had before in the slide before, right? Um, depicting exactly what's going on and the, the contribution of different layers essentially to the insurance program, things change dramatically in two ways. So first, the, 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 uh, essentially you see that, the, for example, the first layer um, increases massively, right? So more than twofold from 26 to 60. Uh, whereas the, uh, the second layer essentially decreases from 26 to 6. Okay, so very different uh, behavior uh, across layers. And then, of course, uh, overall, you can uh, see uh, immediately by taking the sums, essentially, uh, you see that the in, uh, in less granular information uh, understates, essentially, by uh, this particular case, uh, uh, um, roughly 30% the overall premium. So quite substantial results. So this is based, essentially, on applying a, a very specific uh, exposure curve. Think, essentially, of uh, the lowest industrial curve if you prefer, but this is a specific curve with a parameter of five. So um, um, finally, um, just before uh, um, uh, uh, moving on to, uh, to the content of uh, chapter eight of the paper, um, and we, if we go back to the tables that Anna illustrated at the beginning, there are essentially some, uh, so, um, some, um, 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 there is some very important information on individual, individual risks that the, is, um, is received by only 30% essentially of the respondent in our survey. Okay? So what we find here is an example of the way uh, a nice submission would look like, for example, where you see um, some reasonable uh, uh, detail about amounts of insurance, for example, by um, uh, um, uh, country, region, in this particular case is the United States, so you see the states, sometimes you have the postcode and so on. You got a split, for example, between building and contents of the amount of insurance, uh, deductible and so on. Okay? This is, based on our survey, is something very rare and according also to um, uh, colleagues we talked to, uh, is not very common in the London market. Um, we now let Anna discuss, expose your radio, thank you. So I talked before about the, um, the need to have the gross loss ratio, the loss ratio that applies before the treaty that we're pricing. The majority of people call that the from ground up loss ratio, and that to me is not the correct naming, because it's not from ground up, it could be for excess policies, it could be uh, net of facultative, net of quota share, so I prefer to call it gross before this treaty. How do we use that? Apart from using it as a, as a sense check of how the company is running before reinsurance, we need also an indication of that for exposure rating. Because exposure rating essentially splits that gross loss ratio or gross loss cost between how much is retained by the sedent and how much is ceded to the reinsurer. Okay, so exposure rating asks what percentage of that gross loss cost is allocated to the reinsurance layer based on the TIV and a selected exposure curve. So I need to know that gross loss cost. So what we, what we tend to do is use a loss ratio as a proxy. So we use a loss ratio multiplied by the gross premium and we get a gross loss cost which we assume is the same across all policies. You could argue that primary policies could have a different loss ratio than excess policies, but that will require more data. So we do that. An extended me method could be to allocate a loss cost to each policy based on um, each location and based on a risk profile. But that is rarely used because that will require 
an individual risk listing with a uh, lot of details about the policy, oc oc occupancy, construction, and so on. So the most commonly used approach is the first one. You take your gross loss ratio times the premium, that's your gross loss cost. We need a split between CAD and non-CAD because often the risk access of loss treaty doesn't cover CAD losses. So if it doesn't cover CAD losses, we only have to focus on the non-CAD um, loss ratio. If it, is, if it does cover CAD losses, you will have a CAD loss cost from your traditional CAD models, your RMS or AIR. You wouldn't experience rate the CAD component of an excess of loss. So what do we need for the gross loss ratio? Well, we need historical premium and losses uh, aggregated by year, accident year, underwriting year. Uh, we also need to understand the definition of CAD. Okay, it's not a standard definition because companies define CAT losses differently. You could have a, a fire loss in a company, the wildfires last, last year, being categorized as CAT because for a particular company, they define CAT as any loss that for the group is more than, for example, 10 million. Not necessarily talking about natural catastrophes, but the definition for each company may be based on their cost to, to, to that law. So we need to understand how they define uh, CAT losses. Um, then for the actuarial analysis, we take our premiums, we adjust them for rate changes, we take our losses, we adjust them for inflation, and for development, if it, what they have provided us is a incurred loss ratio, we just adjust to, to ultimate as well. And then we reconcile with the student's business plan. So well, I have, I have forecasted this loss ratio, what is your business plan, and then we need to reconcile the differences. If this is not provided, reinsurance companies have a benchmark, and that benchmark will include good companies and bad companies. So the reinsurance company will have a benchmark, for example, of 70% loss ratio, but a particular seed that may be right in business that tends to run at a better loss ratio, so a worse assumption will be made because the data was not provided. So here is an example of the loss ratio. So ideally, I would receive for every year of account or accident year, my ultimate written premium, their ultimate written premium, growth of this treaty, and the sedan's ultimate loss ratio from their reserving, from their reserving numbers. I work that on ultimate loss, adjust for rate changes, adjust for inflation at a 3% in this example, and then I've got my ASIF ULR in the last column here. I then take an average and I come up with an 85% loss ratio. Most pricing models will do this. This is pretty standard, okay? It's called the, the, the trending on leveling methodology. And now I come up with an 85% loss ratio, but the C then tells me that their business plan for 2017 is 74%. I've got 10 point, 11 points difference. Where are my assumptions different to the ones of the C then? Maybe I'm making different assumptions about the large losses. If you note in this example, the older years are on an active basis running at 104, 136. There might be losses there that are already at limit. And then I need to treat them separately because they can't trend any further, they can't develop any further, and so on. So I need to go back to the seed and say, well, how did you put together your business plan? What assumptions have you used? Maybe they just use 1% inflation. Now, do I believe that is a correct inflation? Then that will have to be based on my understanding of why they use 1%, why do I use 3%, where is that coming from? Again, there is no industry standard as the correct inflation assumptions for various lines of business, but we tend to use anywhere between 1% and 5% for property based on um, property price index. So this is very important because my exposure rate will be 11 points higher than any projection done by the sedan or any projection done by the broker, okay? And potentially any projection done by any reinsurer who did not do this analysis, okay? Any reinsurer who didn't, didn't do this analysis, I say, well, if your business plan is 74%, I believe you, they will come up with a price that will be different to the one I'm coming up with because I am doing my own analysis of the gross loss ratio. So that could also um, lead to competitive problems there. 
we, this is effectively what I, have, uh, what I have mentioned, the treatment of inflation, how is the rate change calculated? When they tell me my rate change is 5%, what do they mean by that? I'm going to touch on that later on um, in, the, in the presentation because some companies may include inflation in the rate change. So I may be double counting the effect of inflation. Um, natural catastrophes by year, we might need to separate them and treat them differently. Uh, large losses above a certain threshold, changes in the mix of business. I'm assuming that the experience over the last 10 years is similar. Maybe I'm wrong in that assumption. And then reconcile with CEDAN how they calculated their, their, uh, their business plan. This is where communication is important, to have the channel of communication between the reinsurer and the CEDAN to understand where they're coming from and for them to understand where the reinsurance um, company coming from. Historical limits profile. Enrico talked about the various presentations of limits profile. Uh, so why are we talking about historical limits profile in this part of the presentation? The reason for that is that if the profile has changed significantly over time, the experience analysis bears, uh, uh, has no credibility because you're not comparing apples and apples. So we need to understand the extent of the underlying portfolio's changes over the, num the last uh, few years. The historic limit profiles will help us do that uh, because we can see the, the amount of insurance that they have covered over the years. So the main, the main reason experience lacks credibility, particularly excess of loss experience, is because companies tend to manage their limits throughout the, the cycle. In the, in the soft market, they might reduce their lines. In the hard market, they might increase their lines and so on. So a particular layer could be more or less exposed today than it was in the past. So the traditional approach is to use premium as a proxy for exposure. But the change in premium is not uniform across all layers of the, of the reinsurance program. So in this chapter, we talk about how to use the historic limits profile to make changes, sorry, to make adjustments to the uh, experience results. You take this example, I've got profiles for 2007, 9, and 16, okay? And uh, the company's uh, underlying premium has gone from 14.8 million to 24.5 million. So there is significant growth in this underlying book, but the question for the reinsurer is not the overall growth, but how the growth has changed by layer. So if a reinsurance company is writing a layer three excess of two million, for them, the main concern is how much the change in exposure has been for policies with a two million and above TIV, okay? Not what they have written in the first million. So if you look at this profile, you can see that there has been some change in the three excess of two, but not to the same extent as the overall change, okay? So this um, is required for us to place credibility to the experience rate. So here is a very um, standard example of burn cost rating. I've got my premium, I've got the TIV adjusted for inflation, and I've got 10 years of limits profile. So if I have 10 years of limits profile, I can calculate the exposure rate for every year based on every year's profile. So I've got an exposure rate, just as your column, the fourth column there, you've got an exposure rate in the three excess of two layer over the year. So you can see that the current exposure is 2.1% of the premium whereas 10 years ago, it was 1.32% of the premium. So there is more exposure in the layer, but not to the same level of increase than the overall premium, and not to the same level of increase than the adjusted TIV, okay? So here are the four ways that we can calculate our experience rate, our burn cost. So the first one, which is the, the one with the header burn cost, is just to essentially take losses trended and developed divided by on-level premium. So that's your standard burn cost. So no adjustment for changes in um, exposure. 
The next one is, well, actually, I'm going to recognize that there was some growth, and I'm going to use premium as a proxy for exposure. If we do that, you can see that the trended losses for 2007 get adjusted by a factor of 1.8, because the premium has gone from 14 million to 26 million. Okay, so that's about 80% increase there. Okay. The next column is, well, actually, premium is not a very, very good proxy for exposure because you are subject to uh, rate changes and market condition. The TIV is a better uh, proxy for exposure. So let's adjust, my, the, let's adjust the losses with changes in TIV. So the TIV has gone from 1.3 billion to 2.5 billion. Therefore, I apply that adjustment to that total T, uh, that um, ex that experience in 2007 by that e uh, relative difference in the TIV. But if I was sophisticated enough to go and do my exposure rating for every year, then I'm refining my adjustment. I'm recognizing that the exposure hasn't increased in the layer in the same proportion as premium and TIV. Okay. And then when you look at the burn cost, it makes a huge difference. Your standard approach says your burn cost in the layer is 3.17 of premium with no adjustments for exposure, whereas the, the more refined approach it says is 2.67% of premium. So the extra data and the extra effort in, in, in looking at the changes in exposure by layer actually improves the pricing of this, uh, of this uh, particular layer. Okay? Um, there, is, there is a paper that goes into the details and is referenced in this, in this uh, paper. Okay, so that's why we need the historic limit profile. Now, we don't get it in the submission <coughs> as a matter of standard practice, but if you're a reinsurer and you have reinsured a company for 10 years, you have it somewhere because you have 10 years of submission. So you could do it. Now, not, not many people go the extra mile and do it, but it can be done if it's a client that you have had for a number of, um, of years. Then I'm gonna hand over to Enrico, who's gonna talk about um, classification uh, of, the, of the risks. Thank you, Anna. So I use this table to, um, to introduce essentially some of the, uh, the research projects uh, um, uh, I've been working on and some of the experiences essentially uh, in, um, in trying to, um, uh, uh, to develop uh, data enrichment uh, um, strategies. So um, if you think essentially of making uh, um, the, the most of your data, um, uh, as a standard, for example, in, um, in statistics, you can think of, uh, okay, let's uh, rely on uh, um, uh, uh, a core data set where we have fairly reliable information. In this particular case, uh, it could be commercial industry US data. And let's try essentially to extrapolate uh, by suitably enriching the data set uh, uh, to different countries, right? By taking into account, for example, uh, suitable uh, information, for example, on the uh, suitable configuration of uh, rating factors. Okay, this is typically an exercise that quite diff that's quite difficult because there are limited data available and so on. And so, um, one possibility is to come up with a, a hybrid way where you use some qualitative information such as a metric like this one, where when you see something green, <laughs> that's less risky, something, re something uh, yellow, more or less is as the benchmark curve you're using. If you see something red, essentially your risk is, uh, is way higher. And then, of course, you can modulate it a little bit more, uh, you can graduate it uh, a little bit better because you see some letters H for high, M for moderate, L for low. Okay, that's a possibility, uh, and that can be very useful. Um, if you want to develop this uh, with a um, data-driven uh, approach, or you want to validate, for example, uh, an approach like this one, uh, uh, then, of course, uh, um, you need to get uh, proper uh, um, information right, uh, on the exposures. Um, so, um, and then, of course, the obvious choice will be to focus on large claims, for example, right? To narrow down the problem, try to see essentially whether uh, we could say something about um, the claims that are more, um, uh, most material to insurance, right? So, um, I essentially, um, um, in a couple of slides, I'm gonna, I'm gonna list a few projects where this, uh, this, um, this sort of uh, objective uh, is being pu uh, pursued. Uh, but there are a number of difficulties, essentially, we come across, right? So, uh, so, um, so um, uh, linking, for example, the basic uh, issue of linking claims and exposures is, is incredibly difficult. 
And uh, this is related also to uh, the way uh, companies uh, collect and store information. Uh, it's very common, for example, in my experience, to find, for example, um, some information collected by the claims guys. Um, pricing actually will collect all this sort of information. The sort of classification and rating factors that they pay attention to um, uh, may be different uh, or labeled differently. Um, um, historical information may only be available, for example, um, in a given um, uh, unit or department, uh, and not across the board, uh, and so on. In terms of uh, some of the, for example, um, uh, data requirement that Anna mentioned with our wish list at the beginning, so one, uh, uh, for example, obvious uh, um, source of information would be essentially, um, I don't know, TIV at location. Very important proxy for, for the exposure, right? However, this is typically either not available or it's not entirely clear uh, what the TIV is, right? So we go back essentially to the issue of the funny what is a risk, what do we mean by that, right? So what is the sort of information we get? Is it the uh, amount of insurance on an aggregate basis, uh, a top location, key locations, average, median, and so on? Is it a range? So, uh, when we deal with large claims, uh, then clearly by definition, we are gonna deal with small sample issues, right? Any statistical model, we will try to essentially uh, 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 to apply, to deploy, uh, we not only have to overcome essentially the, some standard data, as mentioned by uh, Martin at the beginning, but also essentially the um, uh, initial implications of dealing with small sample size. A strategy we, we try to, um, uh, to adopt with the uh, um, risk was uh, to try essentially to collect information, to enrich the data set we, uh, we, uh, we, we, we created, we collected, we publicly available information. For example, think of uh, fire protection agencies. Uh, however, this is uh, quite complicated because depending on the jurisdictions, the country you look at, um, it's not necessarily obvious that uh, uh, those data um, uh, uh, are indeed public so, or uh, can be used essentially for um, yeah, for our purposes. So just to give you an example when it comes to, um, yeah, so to linking uh, claims and exposures, uh, I wanted to show you essentially something um, um, that, um, so if you look at the, the, the pie chart at the bottom of the slide, uh, this is based essentially on a project we ran, for example, between Zurich and Singapore, um, where we, we tried essentially to, and also with contributions from, uh, from the London market, the East Coast and Liberty, we try to understand a little bit more, for example, about Asia Pacific, the Asia Pacific region, right? Some of the exposures there. So just to give you an idea, essentially, in terms of getting just the from the ground up losses, right? The source of, um, the diversity of sources we had to rely on, right? So if you see there, so essentially internal, internal to the companies we collaborate with, data source is only 38%, right? Uh, and submissions, 9%, for example. Uh, Anna was talking about PDFs, right? So loss adjusted report and all that, the, 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 the 34% in red there. This is extremely, you know, painful, right? To, to, so that's, if you think, if we go a little bit closer, for example, if you think of the London market, right? So if you think of exchanging, for example, right? So to the best of my knowledge, it's uh, uh, still uh, getting FGO losses, um, it's not achievable nowadays, right? So surprisingly simple and very important information, I think, for any statistical analysis, what we're thinking of, and still it's very difficult to, uh, to get hold of this sort of data. So um, in, in order to get, um, so this is sort of a, on the negative side, but on uh, uh, looking at the bright side, um, if I, for example, can give you an example of um, a project we ran with um, uh, Hiscox, Liberty, and Lloyds, uh, you can actually gain a, a, a lot from a, a fairly limited amount of data, essentially. So I give you here, for example, this is a, a snapshot, essentially, uh, of um, uh, um, um, a data set that uh, uh, collected uh, over, um, let's say, 15 years, between 2000 and 2014. Um, uh, uh, large claims pertaining to large commercial risks. Okay, so essentially um, commercial and manufacturing um, uh, residential property, uh, energy onshore. Okay, so if you see, for example, this is a, a very interesting, so you don't need much, right? Policy ID, claim ID, year of um, account, original currency, region, country, and so on. Um, uh, some fairly broad uh, occupancy classification Nothing truly special. For example, you see there for uh, Eon, um, Energy Onshore, um, uh, some additional information, P for Petroleum, uh, um, actually Petrochemical, 19 for Petroleum, right? So immediately you are able to narrow down 
a little bit more, and fine-tune your statistical model, right? Then you got the FGU, TAV, TSI, and some narrative that can give you some very important information, right? So just uh, organizing a data set um, uh, along these lines uh, can be extremely valuable if you want to uh, uh, start to um, uh, refine a little bit the, uh, the statistical tools uh, you use. Uh, in practice, uh, unfortunately, this uh, requires a lot of work. And uh, in our experience, uh, um, even companies who are very keen, essentially, on engaging in these sort of activities, um, uh, unfortunately, they don't have the data history that would be required to uh, develop a, a robust um, a statistical model. Because, for example, this is a, an issue they've, uh, they started to, to, to become aware of, for example, over the last five to eight years, right? And so clearly they, they were not collecting or storing data uh, they, they had accrued over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, so this is a problem, but it, in my view, and based on my experience, can actually be overcome to some extent by pooling data and trying to uh, exploit synergies uh, between market participants. Um, so this is the uh, slide that I promised where I, I kind of list some of the projects, uh, uh, data enrichment uh, projects. Some of them uh, originated here, London Market uh, Large Commercial Risks uh, data set sponsored by the Insurance Intellectual Capital Initiative. Um, that led essentially to a collaboration uh, um, uh, with SCORE uh, uh, between Imperial and Nanyang Business School in Singapore. Uh, and uh, that resulted essentially in, um, in a data set on uh, Asia Pacific um, uh, large commercial uh, risks that's publicly available. Uh, you can certainly email me for more information if you're interested in. And, uh, and then a couple of initiatives, uh, fire protection agencies, for example, this is um, uh, originally an idea of John Buchanan, uh, a Chris Kent, a very risk. Um, and we're still trying to work on that. And then uh, the LME as well, uh, a loss and exposure data working group headed by Mike Hood, um, Excel Kathleen, uh, they essentially try to focus on uh, carbon and hull and uh, property and energy. Okay, so um, I'll leave it to Anna now to conclude the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. We're running a bit tight, but I'm I going to talk about a hot topic, which is rate changes. Uh, those of you who work at Lois, you know this is on their agenda. Uh, has been f for the last couple of years what the rate change, the changes are because we are in a soft market, and uh, the rate changes do not really reflect what we hear about rate changes. So, how is this um, used in in reinsurance pricing? Well, it is used because we need that for um, experience rating. Now, property reinsurance submissions are very notorious for not providing this information, for not providing rate changes, and if they do, it's very, very limited, okay? In the, in particularly, uh, the, the reinsurance submissions that come to London, they do not tend to provide those, um, uh, th those rate changes. Um, when they do provide it, they don't say what the rate change means. And rate change is one of those definitions that means different things to different people. Okay, so we have to always have a context. What does this mean? The rate change may not be aligned with the premium that they provide. They may be providing rate changes for premium renewed, so written premium, but actually the premium you've got is earned premium. So you have to understand what is that that they are they are providing. So the paper actually presents in detail the framework within the lowest minimum standards of how rate changes should be calculated and what they mean. Um, the, there are two, essentially two definitions of rate change. And depending who you are talking to, you will be talking about different things. So for an underwriter, he's talking about the premium rate change which incorporates a, a, a change in the rate, the rate per unit of TIV or the rate per unit of exposure, adjusted for the exposure change, coverage, and limit attachment. But the risk adjusted rate change, which is the definition at Lloyd, actually includes changes in your view of the risk, which means includes changes in experience. So if you had a claim, you might say that that is linked to a rate change. You change your view of the risk because you now have a claim that you didn't expect. Or you have a loss-free year, so you actually think that the risk is better than expected based on that. So we need to understand the definition of rate change 
in, um, in the context that we are using it. So as an example, on a premium rate change, if, if, the, if the rate per unit of TIV on the slip is 5% less than it was last year, with no other changes, no changes in policy, no changes in TIV, we're talking about a 5% reduction, a minus 5%. However, on that same risk, if you assume that the loss cost for that policy is going to increase with inflation at 3% relative to what you had last year, now you've got 5% less premium and 3% more losses. So the risk adjusted rate change according to the Lloyd's definition will be your change in loss ratio. So it will be a 7.7% rate change because you are worse or your loss ratio is worse of 8%. Okay. Now, the impact of this in pricing is significant because if a sedent tells me that their rate change is minus 777 there, 77%, 77 because they have included inflation but they don't tell me that they included inflation, what do I do in my experience rating? I take the 7% reduction, use that for premium, and then use 3% inflation again on the loss. I'll be double counting, right? If they give me the 5%, I'll be okay, but if they give me this without an explanation, I could be punitive on, on that. So it's important to understand what is the ref definition of rate change for that sedent. Okay, it's a key assumption in, in, in experience rating. Okay, so that is important. So the framework at Lloyd's, they require that the rate change be broken down by how much of the change is due to policy limit structure, your limit deductible attachment, how much of the change is coverage, wording, okay, you added an endorsement, you remove an exclusion, okay, you added new coverages, new perils, so how much of that is changing coverage and everything else. Everything else is, is bundled in other, okay, that other will include experience, a claims inflation, anything that affects the, the, the risk. And the convention is a plus means more coverage, more exposure, and a minus means less coverage, less exposure. And while this may be very obvious to all of us, I have seen people saying the deductible went up, therefore it's a plus, okay? No, it's a minus because you are now better off because your deductible has gone up, you have less exposure. That's why I've always clarified that. There is a prescriptive approach, but it's not closely followed because they tell you what to do, but not how to do it. And therefore, everybody does their own interpretation of it. So here is a quick example of how this should be done uh, according to the minimum standard. So you basically want to reconcile from your expiring premium to your renewal premium, the change in your cash, how much you allocate to each of the components. Now, in this particular example, I said, well, the limit deductible attachment has changed in such a way that I've got 20% more exposure, either from a higher limit or from a lower deductible. Where will I get that 20% from? I will get that by using my first law scale or by using my ILF and say, well, that limit relative to last year's limit is worth 20% more. The change in coverage, the, term, the terms and conditions, I have evaluated that and I said that the, the, the terms are broader, I've got 10% more exposure. It could be because last year we didn't cover flood and now we're covering flood, okay? Or we change the hours close in a, in a property in a property policy. So I've got 10% more. Now, there is a confusion there. For me, that's 10% more. It may be that I did not get 10% more premium for that, okay? So the confusion in the market is that should I put 10% or should I put zero because I actually didn't get anything for that change in wording? Well, you have to put how much you wanted, not how much you got, okay? You wanted more 10%, but you didn't get it, that's fine. That will be your rate reduction. Then other factors will be your exposure and mix. For example, here I've got 30% more exposure and the mix that is better by 10%. So how do I then work out how much is the rate change? I take my expiring premium and I said, in an ideal world, I would have liked to have 20% more for limit attachment deductible, 
10% more for the coverage and 17% for everything else. So on a like for like basis, I should be getting this year 154,000 pounds to call it a flat renewal because I've compensated all the changes. But I'm only actually getting 125. The balance is my rate change. The balance, 19.06%, is rate reduction after adjusting for all the risk factors. So that is the lowest framework, and, um, and that goes into a monthly report called the Performance Management Data Report. And then we come to the commercial aspects of it, just to close quickly here. Uh, we don't operate in a vacuum, okay? We don't say, this is a price I want, and you will always get it. So. Uh, John Buchanan actually prepared these slides and said, well, if you only had one company, then you can charge whatever you want and you will always get. So he set up a scenario here where you only have companies manufacturing pillows and uh, dynamite, dynamite. So two extremes there. Um, and company A is very good at assessing the loss cost, differentiating between the various kinds of, um, of manufacturers. Um, and uh, they price to a 50% loss ratio. So company A always wins the bid because it's the only company operating. But when you have a competitive market, every company will make different assumptions. So in this slide, what we have assumed is a company A is the picky company who always asks for more data and can more accurately come up with a loss cost, okay? without that first line there. And then we go company B, C, and D. Company B is, it said, you know, I charge everyone the same. I charge everybody two and a half as a lowest cost. Uh, and then B and C, C and D somehow, they do some differentiation. So the squares highlight that those are the companies that won that contract because they were the cheapest one. So in the case of um, pillow manufacturer without sprinklers, company C won that bid because they were the lowest uh, in, their, in their pricing. So the consequence of that is that when you're pricing, you arrive at a loss cost, but you don't know whether that's gonna be accurate or not. Okay, you will only discover that later. So we're assuming here that company A is the one that always gets it right, just for comparison, and the other ones uh, don't. So company A wins two contracts, and they run at a 50% loss ratio because they got it right from the beginning. The other companies, although initially they priced at 50%, when the loss comes, they didn't get it right, so they run a different loss ratio. So for example, company B, who got the contract for the most risky one, dynamite without sprinklers, they won that because they were the cheapest one. They run at 100% loss ratio because they didn't differentiate. So the consequence of that is that the most sophisticated company will not always be the winner, right? Uh, so they lose a competitive edge because they are more accurate at pricing, but the other companies, on the other hand, they have the winner's course because they won because they were the cheaper, but they're making a loss, okay? This is all in a, in a paper that was presented a number of years ago in a, at, a gyro, at a gyro company. So company A will always run at 50%, but the rest of the market will run at a much higher loss ratio because they didn't classify the risk accordingly. And there are other illustrations about loss of market share, et cetera, for, uh, related to that, to that example. So we always have a bias in the data, okay? When we talk about the incentive from the students, we're saying, well, better data leads to better prices. So would that mean that only companies that know that they are better will produce the data. So companies that do their own analysis say, well, be better, don't provide that, and they will keep quiet about providing that information. What do we do with new risks? Are we going to assume that risks that are either new or with insufficient data will always be worse risk? That's a very pessimistic assumption. It might be a startup company, but they might end up being very good at what they do. So that's another question. And then hard versus soft market, unfortunately, you do get different items of data depending on the market. But I was pricing reinsurance in 2002, just after September 11, I could get anything I asked for, 
because the prices were going through the roof. So people wanted to make sure that they provided the information because they needed to bring that reinsurance cost down. Now, they say, no, we don't need it. It's already placed. Do you, do you want it or, or, or no? So you don't get any data, and it's already placed. So you are working with that disadvantage. Also, what I said before, not all reinsurers request the same information. Some are happy to be the first one in. I'll be the first one in, I'll be the nicest person, so I'll try to get the first share. Particularly those that are new in the program, they try to quote fast so that they have a higher chance of getting a share of the, of the program. The internal processes, the referral processes, are also another hurdle because in some companies, particularly in the US, the actuaries have to go through a significant referral process that a number of, of people have to approve their pricing, whereas you have the opposite in the London market where actuaries are not even involved in the pricing, where the underwriter has a model that was given to him by an actuary, and he can do whatever he wants. So he can quote without all of this. So you also have that as a disadvantage in some, in some cases. I think we can skip this, this uh, two part, the country specific issue. So there are emerging markets that don't really, un don't really understand what this data elements are required for compared to a very established market like the US or the UK, of the UK um, market. Then I've got some closing remarks before we go into the Q&A. Uh, there is a significant gap between a theoretically, uh, a theoretically good submission where that allows it actually to perform all the methods that we have learned that, that we have in all the various models with the data that, that we receive. But the problem arises from the, the, from the very basic step when the insurance company prices their um, their policies. That, that has an impact all the way to the rest of the, of the tower because the data may not, be, uh, may not be available. Then again, incentive, we talk about the winner's curse and bias in, um, in the data. Okay, so now we can, we can take some questions. Anna and Enrico, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so now we can open up for questions from, from the floor. Just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded for the British Actuarial Journal, so if you could please state your name before your question, that would be fantastic. So would, would anyone like to kick off the questions? We do have some microphones, I think. I start with one, Martin? That's okay. Go so, um, one of my sort of things looking at the paper, I guess, was you talk a lot around the um, different definitions and the whole range of things. And I think it's interesting just seeing some of these things around policy limits. I was quite scared by the number of acronyms you had in there. I wrote down MPL, PML, MFL, EML, TIV, etc., etc. I just wondered, I mean, you sort of make the case that these things have a particular purpose and a use, but it struck me, surely there's just far too many of these. Is, is there really a need for all of these definitions? Is there no way to standardise or to bring about some sort of consistency? I'm just interested to hear a bit more about that. Well, yeah. we, we do need, we do need consistency of the definition and also how they go from the actual amount insured to a, to a PML, to a probable maximum loss. How, how do they distinguish between, well, this bill is insured for 10 million, but the PML is 6 million? Is that done at the underwriter's discretion? Is there any systematic way of doing that? Because at the end of the day, when there is a loss, the, it's the actual loss that will be covered. So there is a problem there that if the submission only includes uh, the, the probable maximum loss value instead of the actual amount of insurance, the reinsurer will be exposure rating on a reduced value, which doesn't consider that the loss could actually be the, the, full, the full insured value. So they've already, in a way, reduced the exposure by coming up with this with this PML. But yes, the industry needs a standardization of, 
of naming conventions, which is not easy because you're dealing with four, uh, three or four major broking firms mm -hmm. worldwide. Each one will have their own definition, but even within the same broking firm, each team will have their own way of presenting it. Uh, so there is, no, there is no consistency there. And what reinsurers tend to do, if what they receive is not the actual TIV, but a PML, so a reduced exposure, then they will exposure rate on that plus a load. They'll say, well, I'm going to stretch that PML by another 20, 30% to allow for the fact that the treaty will actually react on actual loss, not on a probable maximum loss. But that's with everything, with the rate change. What's the definition of rate change? And what's technical price? What is benchmark price? I mean, all of those will have different meanings within different companies. Yeah, so I fully agree with Anna, and uh, I think every all of us can do something uh, because um, you know it's a free market. So clearly, there are different acronyms because um, different market participants might find useful uh, um, different quantities. Uh, but I think the um, uh, at the very least, uh, within the same company, there should be uh, an effort uh, to standardize and understand uh, these quantities. Because after all, uh, apart from uh, uh, operational considerations, bus business considerations, any statistical model that can be used essentially to validate whatever um, actuaries are doing or, um, uh, or to check, essentially keeping check uh, what underwriters are doing, needs to rely on firm quantities uh, there really allow you to relate essentially any claims or actual losses to the exposure that's being taken on. So I think that would be, that would be essential and uh, something that essentially is actually relatively straightforward, um, I believe. <laughs> right. any, any questions from any, from the Floyd Chamber to think about any questions? Uh, yeah, question here. Hello, my name is Ken Leung, and um, after listening to the talk, um, there is an underlying thread about the quality of data. And I'm wondering if the insurance companies know that providing more da better quality data will lead to better pricing. What are the incentives for them not to do so? And is uh, is there a, uh, uh, some communication between uh, the reinsurance companies and the reinsurers, uh, whether it's always going to be uh, providing better quality data that leads to lower price, or would, there be, would it go other way that when the insurance companies provide more data will lead to a higher price in their reinsurance? It could go both ways. Yes, it could go both ways. Uh, usually, they will have someone internally looking at, they will have the outwards team doing some sort of pricing, and then they will reconcile with what they're getting from, from the market. But the, the, the incentive really is two ways. One, if the reinsurance company is not communicating directly with the sedent, you've got a broker in between and they block a lot, okay? Um, depending, some, so again, it varies widely, but the, 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 the questions, the data questions, so for example, when I go through the submission, I say, oh, I need this, I need this, I need this. I have to email the broker asking, can we get that? I cannot go directly to the sedent. And then that broker may go back to the sedent and, and ask for the data. Often the question back comes about why do they need that? We've, we've not provided it before, so why do they need it now? Uh, that's, that's a very common way of saying, you, you've priced this before without it, why do you need it now? Or well, we've got a new actuary, or you know, we've got a new model, whatever. Uh, so that's one. And secondly, the underwriter, the reinsurance underwriter, when I work with underwriters, I say, you know, can we ask this data? I say, you know, why? We, we're ready to quote. Why do you need that now? So it could, bo it could go both ways. But some, some reinsurers will not quote without that data. They simply will not quote without, without that. 
Now, sometimes the data is, is just cannot be produced. They just simply don't have it. If I say, you know, can you provide the last 10 years of limits profile? They will come back and say, look, it took us three weeks to get you the latest one because we have to manually clean it and format it and all of that. We can't do 30 weeks in getting you 10 years. That simply is a process issue that, that, that it all comes down, I always say to people, it all comes down to IT, okay? All the insurance problems, all the insurance data problems that we have, it all comes down to IT, okay? If you've got an, a, a, a good IT system, you can provide the data. If you don't, then yes. Question from Martin. Um, Martin White. Um, the, the answer you gave just now prompted this question, which is some sedents operate direct, even though you may have a market that is both brokerage, you know, it's essentially a brokerage market. Some sedents operate direct. That means they can talk to the, uh, sorry, some reinsurers operate direct. And would you say that those reinsurers are at a commercial disadvantage against those who have a blocking broker? Probably they can get more data if they have a direct communication. So often what I find is that if I can talk to the actuary of the seeding company, I can get more because he or she will understand me more than the outward reinsurance team. Remember that this is all corporate, corporate, so you've got an outward reinsurance team, which often does not include an actuary, preparing the submissions, uh, and they don't really understand how actuaries work what we need. So if I can get a, a telephone call or a meeting with the sedans actually, then 90% of the chance of, of the time I can get what I need in that. Thanks, there's a, two more questions first on this side. Thanks uh, for the presentation, first of all. So, my name is Gillis from, from Swiss Re. Um, more a uh, kind of practical question. Are you in dialogue with, um, with our seed and companies and, and uh, kind of just the industry to, to kind of standardize the, the information that we get? Or it, you know, what, what do you see as a timeline in terms of when we get to a point where all the data we get for our risk excels is, is usable? I have one objective this year, which is to put a template. This is a standard submission, blank, with headings and all of that. I'll put it on my company's website and email the link to all brokers. This is what you're talking about. There is no need to have different presentations for different seasons, right? Your premium, year premium, all in one page. I don't need 10 pages of premiums. I don't need 10 pages of losses, one for 2001, one for, no, I want all in one page because I'm gonna cut and paste from that into a rating model and most rating models look the same. You've got a year and a loss. So we don't need one tab for every year and they do that. Uh, and and, and, and it, it, is, it is something that can be standardized and even within the same company, the same sedent, if you look at their property submission, it looks different to their casualty submission. They should have the same template because they have the same system from where they're downloading. But yes, it is something that, that at some point has to be standardized with correct names of tabs and, and headings and currencies. All of that should be pretty clear. It's not always clear. But so how far away do you think that is, or how long do we have to wait till we get to a point where, where we can reliably get good data and, and risk lists and so on? <laughs> I don't know, I've been waiting a long time. Uh, it, it's, it's, I, I, I went to a conference uh, in November and the CEO of a big multinational company said the insurance industry is lacking behind in techno when it comes to technological advance. You are all actuaries. I mean, you, how much time do you spend cleaning data? We shouldn't be cleaning data. 
It should all come clean if you have the right system. So yes, the insurance industry is behind embracing technology, embracing automation, embracing the fact that there is a world of technology behind Microsoft Excel. Okay, and we have not embraced it yet. So we are uh, behind big time on that. And that is why we are in this situation. Thanks. You sound forever the optimist. Hmm? <laughs> but you sound as if you're forever the optimist for that improvement. It will made. come, but it will come at the time when the insurance, com the insurance companies are, well, they're struggling with expenses and so many processes can be automated. And they, it will come, I think, the problem is when the insu insurance practitioners like us can speak to an IT professional <laughs> in a common language, then we will get somewhere. But that is kind of the barrier. We don't speak the same language as those that can do the technology for us. It's very daunting to do an IT project in an, in an, in an insurance company. Yeah, so, so in my experience, uh, some of the data projects I, work, uh, I worked on, uh, there are, um, so the market is quite diverse. So there are uh, companies that uh, have invested considerable resources in uh, data enrichment, uh, data cleansing, and so on. And so whenever one thinks of um, industry-wide uh, initiatives and uh, speeding up the process, uh, then of course clearly there is a resistance there, right? Because they have an informational advantage, uh, they do things well, well in advance of others. And at the same time, this is Martin's point, um, at the very beginning, it's um, a number of companies perceive the entire process as being extremely costly, right? Um, so, there are, so the incentives are not necessarily aligned with a fast convergence towards a standardized uh, um, submission. And in that sense, I would agree with Anna, that it's gonna take uh, quite a while <laughs> before that happens. I think there's one, one question across the aisle, and then I think we'll, uh, we'll close. Hi, thank you. Uh, Daniel King, hi um, In today's soft market, how much value do you think this still holds compared to, say, as you uh, mentioned in 2002, very hard market, where today, for instance, uh, reinsurer may accept a lower rate just to stay on the program to obtain that premium income? Does this um, additional data have today? compared to the hard market of 2002? Yeah, at, at the moment, you can place anything you want uh, without much data. I mean, this is a, a, a buyer's market, particularly on the, on the reinsurance side. I think now you provide the bare minimum and uh, the incumbent market, the reinsurance market, they will, they will um, try to get their line um, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately, you also have the issue of the, the, the CAD models. Uh, the, the CAD models give you a price, but the price of the market is nowhere close to what those models are. So yes, it's, it's, it's a problem because you are in a, competitive, in a competitive market. They don't need to provide the data to get the deal done uh, as, as they did in 2002, 2000, uh, 2002, 2003. And that also applies to insurance. Uh, the, the buyers of insurance, uh, again, they, they, they don't have to provide much to get, to get coverage. Uh, so yes, at the moment there is no incentive uh, uh, to provide more, but one day the market will change and um, they will want to provide more because they will say, well, how is my premium going up 50% if I haven't had a loss? Well, because there is no capacity. Now this is a seller's market. If you want me to reassure you, I want your data. That will happen. Well, when, I don't know. Thank you very much. So if I could, if I could now hand over to, uh, to Kevin Renzel to offer some closing comments. Uh, Kevin is uh, Chief Actuary for Allianz UK. He's an active member of the IFOA, having joined the General Insurance Practice Board last year. Um, and he's volunteered to close this evening's session. Kevin. Thanks, Martin. Um, thank you to both of you for a really interesting talk. I've been trying to jot some things down as we go, but um, I'll probably start by saying that there's three themes that I felt came through the paper and have actually come through again today. Uh, the first theme is around communication. Um, at its heart, I think what you're talking about is a paper saying we need to communicate better um, and talking about the benefits that come from that. 
So it struck me around um, talking around what we choose to share. So I work for a company um, in the direct market and we seed our business to reinsurers. And you're completely right that there's the whole chain between ourselves and brokers and reinsurers. And I liked your point about if I could just pick up the phone to the actuary at the seed and company, we get a better price. So I think that sounds like a great idea. Um, the, the point around some of the things as well with terminology I still find fascinating. You touched on the point around some of these definitions. You talk particularly around rate changes, um, what triggers a cat loss, um, use of using positives and negatives and how that gets confused. It strikes me the whole thing is a real minefield there and again we really don't help ourselves to communicate and share that information in the best way that we can. Um, and that led me to the point that really my second reflection was at its heart, this is quite a simple idea, and sometimes those simple ideas are the best. You're talking about sharing of information being a win-win. Well, maybe as was mentioned earlier, it's a buyer's market at the moment, so perhaps we're not quite getting there. But as you say, that market will turn, prices will rise, and at that point we need to be prepared um, to share the information that gets us to the right assessment of risk and the right prices. You said that sometimes the information isn't available, and I think we would all recognise that. Um, but I like the point you make that IT at the heart of it um, is often what we need to work with and need to overcome. Um, I too have seen presentations where PDF formats are provided and people wonder why it then becomes difficult to get at the information which we need. And when you stop and reflect and think of the tools that we use day in, day out, it's obvious that that's not the way to present our information to get it used. You talked about the difficulty linking claims to exposures. These are some of the most basic things that we would need, um, and hearing that that still creates difficulty um, is surprising. It made me think back as well when you talk within the paper around having individual pricing. Um, I worked in life insurance many, many years ago, and there we used to do things where we'd get individual risks for every single policyholder insured, and that was common practice. And yet we're just nowhere near that yet in the GI space, or at least still making progress towards it. And the last thing I wanted to reflect on was really it was good to see a paper on pricing. Pricing is often an area where it's hard to come together and collaborate. I remember seeing some examples where I think, well, if I've got the best idea, why would I want to share? But here's a great example of a paper where sharing information doesn't cause competitive issues. It actually helps to get a more efficient and better market. It's obvious that there's real experts that have contributed to this. Um, I think you quoted 44 respondents with a lot of experience and a lot of geographical spread. Um, and I think what's in there is some real practical advice, both for cedents and reinsurers. And so for any of you who have not read the paper yet in detail, I do commend you to do so. I liked your checklist. The basics are what we need. And I liked your optimism that we're going to have a standardised way of submitting things in the not too distant future. And the winner's curse was a good reminder to refer back to that paper and the issues that come up. So I think in summary, a really good paper, a worthy winner of the award that was touched upon earlier. Um, and I look forward to, I think you said there's going to be a follow up with the Working Party on Energy? Yes, yeah, because every class of business faces their own, their own issues. Um, so the, the, the short deadlines are the ones that need more work. I think casualty is a more mature market when it comes to reinsurance because of the nature of the line of business. But the, the, short, the short deadlines are still behind. So yes, something on energy I hear from, from John. So I look forward to reading that. But as I say, I conclude by saying thank you and thank you for a, an interesting presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I know we're finishing a few minutes later than planned. All that's all that remains for me to do today now is to thank uh, Anna, thank you Enrico, thank you Kevin for being here, for your energy this evening. Thank you all for your time and for your questions uh, and thanks to the IFOA for organising the event. Have a very good evening. Thank you.